So today, uh, David will present us, uh, I think this is your, your own project, right, David? Thanks for giving me the opportunity to shamelessly promote my project, uh, um, which is uh, something I spent the last couple of months on. Um, so my name is David Novak. I'm with MasterCard at the moment. Um, so my project is called Shvir, which is a sidecar written in Rust. So who I am is a uh, LinkedIn and I'm also available on Discord. Since that's where it seems to be where all the uh, uh, Rust programmers are. As I said, I'm a MasterCard moment, kind of uh, working as an enterprise architect, software engineering space, um, mostly with Java world, uh, Spring Boot particularly. Um, personally, I like event-driven programming and I definitely don't do GUIs. Uh, I find them particularly frustrating. So outline of this presentation would be, well, first I'd like to briefly introduce sidecars, the concept of sidecars, then I talk a little bit about Schwer, and then the uh, Schwer and Rust. So why Rust, what sort of experiences I had uh, for the last couple of months uh, working on this project. So, uh, you know, to normal people, when you talk about sidecars, they probably, that's what they envisage, this little side box uh, on the motorbike. Um, but for the software oriented people, this uh, slightly different meaning. Um, this is this kind of diagram taken from the Microsoft side. Um, they pretty big into sidecars. Uh, but um, the concept is that you can split your application into the primary bit and then the side process, uh, which is uh, on the same host. So it is important to say that Sidecar has access to the same uh, underlying system as the primary application. So primary application will have its core functionality and then certain aspects of uh, logic could be offloaded to the Sidecar. So, you know, abstraction, logging configuration. That's kind of a typical usage. Um, this is, uh, applicable to, you know, virtualized boxes or real life real boxes, hardware boxes. And it's also applicable to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is superb for using sidecars. Um, it makes it very easy to add a sidecar to your application. Um, so I suppose that's the, hence the popularity of those, of the sidecars at the moment. Um, I kind of made attempt to create a taxonomy of sidecars. In, this is kind of looking at it from the uh, functionality perspective of how the sidecars might affect the primary application. And I think they could be kind of uh, divided into three types. So type one is observers, type two proxies, and type three uh, platforms. Um, so what are those observers? Um, so the observer sidecar, the way I see it, is something that, well, if it crashes, it crashes, the application still works, right? So um, this is kind of, um, you know, you can apply it to logging. So, you know, the primary application does its logging, writes to a file system, there is a sidecar that takes those logs, ships them to whatever centralized location uh, needs to be shipped. Uh, the application is none the wiser, right? So. I could um, switch my logger or the, the application that ships, uh, reconfigure, do whatever I want to do. Uh, it won't impact the main application lifecycle. The other, so I mentioned the Jaeger operator, Prometheus operator, common logging platforms. Uh, the, other as, the other aspect of uh, application could be uh, monitoring of Java applications with JMX protocol. You know, the main application opens the JM export, the sidecar connects to it, you can do profiling of your application. If the sidecar dies, well, you can restart it, the application is unaffected. And so these will be the observers, they generally don't mess with the application. All right, so there you go. Uh, the second type would be the proxies. <clears throat> um, in this case, we need application to, application doesn't change. So I could redeploy my application to a traditional environment without a sidecar. All I need to do is reconfigure certain aspects, right? Um, 
but uh, I could also deploy it with a sidecar and then sidecar could take certain functionality, offload certain functionality. Uh, typical examples of proxy, the way I see it, is Envoy, um, which is part of Istio or, or other meshes, and Linkerd proxy, which is part of Linkerd. Actually, Linkerd is also a Rust, and it's also a sidecar, if you didn't know. Um, so this is the typical example. So primary application sidecar. So let's say um, the good example here would be um, enabling the legacy application to use TLS2, uh, 1.2. Instead of rewriting my legacy code that uh, nobody knows how it works, I can still um, put a sidecar in front of my app, which will intercept all the HTTP calls and then put them on a TLS connection uh, and send them on the merry way to the uh, destination. Or I could um, you know, orchestrate my applications and allow them to uh, find each other and create meshes and fancy meshes and whatnot. And so my, the, the application does not need to change. There's no changes in the dependencies. There might be changes in the config, uh, but the sidecar takes a lot of that functionality away. Um, the third sidecar type of sidecar, which is the platform, that's something that Sphere is. Um, and basically it's sort of a application where applica the, the, the primary application can't work without the sidecar. So even if a uh, reconfiguration won't change and a uh, sidecar will take loads of heavy lifting, loads of dependencies on, on, on its, uh, as, um, uh, it will take responsibility for that. So the other platform that I know of is Dapper, which is uh, implemented by Microsoft. And I sort of started on a Rust version of the same. All right, so in this case, for example, I could have a primary application that's using a REST interface to do PubSub. And with a platform sidecar, I could change my PubSub to be uh, Google PubSub, to be Kinesis, to be Kafka, Nuts, uh, whichever backend I would like to use in a different environment. The primary application doesn't need to change at all. And that's the, that's the beauty of the sub platform sidecar. The primary application does not need to have any dependencies on the uh, PubSub. Uh, everything is abstracted to kind of stable uh, interfaces. Now there is a, obviously there are trade-offs because now the interface, we have to provide the same functionality across different platforms. Uh, but there are benefits if you want to migrate your logic between different cloud vendors, when you want to be technology agnostic and stuff like that. So um, that's kind of uh, uh, everything about the sidecars. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, I think we could ask them now and try to answer to make it clear before we move on. Okay, I move on to the next section, which is the Sphere. So Sphere is a project which is open source on GitHub. We have our own web page as well. Um, there are links for those who might want to check it. Uh, you can start us on GitHub, the more the better. Uh, but Sphere is, yeah, the way I put it, Sphere is a platform allowing you to build a collect microservices quickly, right? It's a, offer similar functionality to, to Dapper, Microsoft version of it. Uh, so, but Microsoft version is really the Go. Um, there are different concepts here and there, but uh, we try to, to, to get uh, as much functionality as much in as possible. The architecture of Sphere is simple enough um, and it uses uh, lots of uh, Rust concepts. So um, this diagram kind of uh, shows more or less the main building blocks. So we have a REST interface, uh, HTTP 1.1, HTTP 2. That's because we have Hyper. Hyper server provides everything that we need um, for handling incoming and outgoing uh, HTTP calls. Uh, for gRPC, we use Tonic, which is also using Hyper. So Tonic is a um, uh, kind of a framework built on top of Hyper to handle uh, uh, gRPC exclusively. And um, then we use memory channels to abstract the backends from, 
from the client interface. So for messaging, we have Kafka, NATS, and AWS handlers. Uh, for persistence, Redis and AWS DynamoDB. And then we've also created service invocation and discovery, which allows you to do meshing the uh, spheres and um, invoking API logic on different uh, applications. All of that um, is logged or can be centrally analyzed with Jaeger or Prometheus because we have open telemetry uh, implemented with uh, the appropriate risk package. So that allows us to reconfigure Sphere so we can use Kafka in, I don't know, one environment, AWS in an AWS environment and, and certain other things. Um, the also the service invocation discover, we have zero config of MDLS. So all the Sphere instances can uh, discover each other pretty seamlessly. David, before you move on, it's not totally related to uh, the whole concept, but how do you find hyper? Uh, is it like well battle tested? Can be used in production? Yeah, I I've been testing hyper, so I've run some performance testing of the whole sphere. Um, never had. Be any problems with Hyper? Uh, I was bringing it up to um, eight, uh, yeah, eight thousand uh, um, transactions per second. Everything on the local host, so 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 that's a different story. But yeah, the, uh, I, I've been using it for both Tonic and Tonic's built on top of Hyper um, as well, um, and I'm using the Hyper for outgoing connections. Um, I can't say I had any big issues with that. Thank you. you know, and um, that uh, another thing is actually very important. Uh, so, when I was starting Sphere, right, I was kind of like, "What technology to use?" Right? Oh God, so many different things. Right? And I, uh, I knew what I wanted to do, so I was like, "Okay, yeah, let's find the something that handles HTTP connection." So Hyper was the top scoring. Look at the examples there; they were simple enough. Great, and I'm um, actually. To some extent, that was a lucky choice because that everything is built around Hyper and particularly around Tokyo. So Tokyo is um, this uh, library framework to handle async calls on uh, uh, in Rust, uh, but it also is a good channel on Discord. And it seems to be a group of very good software developers, very committed software developers, whether they're sponsored or not, hard to say who are working on a kind of coherent set of tools. So, you know, it's Tokyo itself, it gives you channels, executors, futures, things like that. But then Hyper is also part of the same channel. So those guys are talking to each other. So Hyper is moving towards Tokyo and Tonic is built on top of Hyper in Tokyo. And again, you know, Lucio, the guy who's, who's running Tonic, yeah, he's part active on tracing, on Prost, on, on all those components, right? So on this course, they're part of the same group. They're not necessarily part of the same GitHub, um, but on this course, they're very close together and they're, very, uh, they're working closely together, which is great. Because from my perspective, I did not want to spend time on, oh, I have this library, how does it work with that library? You know, I like this idea, like, yeah, you know, I like this. Everything is kind of connected, works. We've tested that with that. We're using that library. Great. I could, you know, apply it straight away. So from my perspective, that was a lucky choice of Hyper. Uh, and everything that came around with that, it actually sped up a lot of my stuff. Um, since, you know, Tonic is started using tracing, Hyper is using tracing. Oh, great, I can add tracing straight away. You know, it works. It's, there's, no, this is, there's no clashes as such. But on top of that, we're using RD Kafka, uh, which is probably the only library which is uh, non-Rust native. It requires the C version of it under the hood. NATS, there's a good set of libraries to connect to AWS, Rosato. So I'm using here DynamoDB and Kinesis and they basically wrappers around the REST interfaces for Risotto. 
uh, for AWS, Redis, MDNS, lots of um, lots of stuff in various levels of maturity. You know, but it's there. So how it started? Hey, yes, it was a deep dive straight away. Like um, I knew what Dapper was, sort of. I knew what functionality they were on to, to offer. I decided, yep, if I want to get it done in Rust, let's start straight away, you know. Um, so yeah, it was a deep dive into uh, examples and processing different files and uh, connecting and all that stuff. But Rust is, it, I don't find is it particularly hard. This is the timeline of the project. So uh, I don't know, people might find interesting or encouraging, you know. So I started about 25th of the time. That was the first comment. So it was hyper arrest, Kafka, channels. That was all um, non-ansync. It was, you know, the, the initial code and nuts. So the switching to async was a big thing, but it's particularly because some projects already switched to async, some projects did it. It was different branches. So, so it was kind of a little bit more digging around to figure out which project is already there. Um, so that took some time. Then gRPC added uh, in December, um, and that was lots of rewrites because you know you figure I go, oh yeah, that might not work, or that I've learned more about idiomatic Rust, so I rewrote some code to to to, to follow those guidelines. Uh, and crisp is uh, that the website had to be done and lots of other stuff. So, 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 um, you know, this is, it's not just the code, it's, it's lots of other things around the project. So March, we had the state interface, which was quite straightforward after all the rewrites and then a persistent, uh, same. Uh, and then the, the service invocation is covered. That was a major feature because I'm, um, um, yeah, zero config MDNS that only works in traditional environments and doesn't work on uh, ECS. But then that also required me to rewrite or change some of the libraries. Then the AWS required a custom registry, so that took some time. And dynamic load balancing for Tonic. So that was something I was pretty proud because that was by um, uh, commitment to the open source. It's uh, I've added that feature to Tonic, which was accepted. So I was happy with that. And then, you know, the, the guys are very helpful and um, they, they're always happy to, to, to provide pointers, you know, accept the code that talk about features. So that's that's particularly nice as well about the, the Tokyo environment. And tracing and spanning. So that was June. And then, yeah, uh, July, version 03 was released actually, um, which is lots of examples, Kubernetes examples um, on how to run it in different environments. Probably less code, but more of the uh, ensuring that the code runs in various uh, options and configurations and different, um, in different environments. And then the plan is now to provide the cube operator um, at some stage. So, um, that's for Kubernetes on the environments. So I let you know when it's finished and maybe present on that. So Rust, why Rust? Huh? Well, primary motivation was it's something new. I've been looking at Rust for three years, sort of reading about it, following it up, um, trying to figure out where where it, where it will go. Um, it was time to bite the bullet. Um, Envoy. Envoy is written in C++, so I was like, uh, I don't want to go there. Dapper, as I mentioned, is written in Go. Not a big fan. And Spring and Java, well, it's a day-to-day -day boring stuff for me and um, probably not the most suitable for um, uh, for sidecars due to the JVMs and stuff like that. Other than that, Rust is awesome. It's uh, I do like it. It's you know I like the way the, the code flows. The, it's terse, expressive. It's not, uh, not too much boilerplate. So so it's cool. But yeah, you know, I'm um, um, I'm I'm not particularly 
you know, I'm sitting in the middle. It's the glass is never full and never empty. It has there 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 is downsides to Rust. Uh, maybe not to Rust, but to a particular ecosystem of it. So the still key here, kind of uh, the main points that I my main uh, observation, right? So stable. It's not. It's frank with so the language might be stable, but the the all the libraries that you need to use are. Uh, in flux, right? So you have frequent changes to interfaces. Like uh, at the moment, I think I have uh, 300 dependencies. Uh, none of them direct, some of them are indirect, obviously, but I'd say 90% of those are zero point something or other. People don't want to commit to version one, which would uh, require backwards compatibility. Um, so recently I had to upgrade the NAT um, uh, backend and yeah, complete rewrite. Indeed, actually that was uh, particularly tricky because they vaded their own um, executor on uh, 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 the back. So the problem, lots of crates doing the same things differently, right? So. Yeah, and Rust is open, great. Lots of people love it. Lots of people sit down, oh yeah, let's create this library for this. I need to solve that. You know, and um, some of those crates are better than other. It's very, I found it very hard to ascertain which crate is good, which crate is maintained. Um, that's one of the main pain points. Like, I think for success of Java now is, Spring Boot makes it so, boring to write in Java, you know. I'm not saying it's good from the development perspective. Indeed, probably not. But you know, the average guy, annotation driven programming, it's, yeah, lots of this hard stuff is hidden away. And we would need, I think Rust needs something similar, a company that goes, yes, and we are going to support these five modules and yeah, you know, because they support it and they have new features, people start using them. And you know, there'll be kind of a standard across the, the, the across the, the Rust and it'll be easier to for other for newcomers to go, okay, this is what I need, this is this is how I'm going to do that. At least from enterprise perspective, I think that'll be a great sales point. Anyway, so searching dependencies, pain, so two different examples. So uh, cargo, uh, sorry, crates.io and libs.rs. Completely different results for the same search. Um, you know, you might be searching for HTTP, you get some sort of obscure library that does something not necessarily related. Um, well, it's a vibrant ecosystem. It's sort of hard to find things sometimes. And the, the other major paid point I see is the ASIC library. So uh, well, yeah, as far as I know, there's at least three. So it's Futures, Tokyo, and ASIC Standard. They have similar interfaces, similar behavior. They do similar things. Why do we need three? I have no idea. And, and 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 some of those libraries were even started by the same guy. So, you know, async STD is a continuation of Tokyo, right? Oh, what happened? And say with async executors, Tokyo versus small. And, you know, in theory, they work together, but sometimes you run into some sort of low level uh, locking issue you just don't want to debug that. And it's like, oh God, how do I even start debugging it? You know, so, uh, so um, stick with one if possible. Be, that's my um, uh, my take off of it. Tooling, cargo is uh, great. I mean, you have formatting, Clippy gives you the outdated uh, packages if you really want to. Uh, three dependencies, it does the compilation. Superb. No, it's, it's it's a cool tool, but it's slow. I mean, you know, it, to, to recompile from scratch is uh, very slow, and sometimes there's no other way of doing it. Um, in terms of IDEs, 
I've tried, I think, everything. Uh, IntelliJ, VS Code, uh, Eclipse, uh, Emacs. Um, I think IntelliJ is probably one of the, the best. The, the only drawback is it doesn't have a debugger. Uh, you probably need to pay for the, I, 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 the the C version of it. Eclipse is, it works. Uh, visual code, it, I didn't like that I can't vote the code from the Visual Studio. So Emacs is the, uh, I'm sticking with Emacs for time being. Um, you know, just because it's awkward. Um, and then, Sort of conclusions, really, you know. By no means, I'm an expert in Rust. And I have no interest in becoming one. There is the whole list of, you know, deep level Rust compilers. It's great if you love it, you know, you might be interested in it. I like to build things relatively quickly. Um, so no interest in the, the, the low level stuff. Never used any esoteric features. Macros, well, never had to do one test so far, none. Probably lots of other stuff that I don't even know of, right? But yeah, when you put it together, it works. It, it does, you can build cool applications with Rust at the moment, which was uh, one of the main things that I like to, I wanted to check when I started as well, you know? So yeah, happy enough with that. Um, and, and yeah, code is there. Have a look. If you have any questions, uh, pick me. And uh, if you want to commit something, there's tons of features to be added. So that's sort of it. Thank you. Cool. Uh, if you don't use tests, are, are, are you not using tests at all? No, I'm not using unit test uh, or the test functionality that the Rust provides. I, I, I have integration tests. So before I ship anything, I just spin up a Docker uh, solution uh, and run those. Um, so, so no, the code is tested. The code's working. It's, there's no unit test as such. Cool. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah, probably loads. Um, hi David, thanks for sharing that. Um, just, I, I guess, to map the sidecar that you that you mentioned, sidecar has been used in Kubernetes, and um, in that area, the sidecars are basically sh shared containers in the in the idea of a, what they call a pod. Sort of how how do I write an application that's you that sits inside of swear so or it doesn't do it. yeah this is the whole thing so if i go back to um, uh, so you write your application um so uh, we have the, the the github we have uh defined interfaces uh, via open api spec or the uh, grpc and from those you can generate your client code Ideally, right? And then you stick your business logic around the client code and uh, deploy that. So your application is runnable still, but it only had needs the gRPC or HTTP outgoing calls. And that would talk to the sidecar. So you have two different processes, two different images as such. You still have an image of your application, uh, which without sidecar does nothing. And then you have your sidecar that will do the more interesting stuff like pop up, storing your data, um, uh, handling security, let's say you want to do some fancy encryption, the sidecar could do that. So you offloading all that uh, logic that, you know, in, in enterprise environment, you would share it with, you know, all applications would sort of share it or try to share it uh, to promote reuse of the code and ensuring that all the same practices are applied everywhere into sidecar. And then your primary application is mostly just your business logic. Okay, but my, I'm sorry, I'm I'm being I'm very dumb here. Yeah, no. um, is my primary application a standalone process that I can write in Java, or do yes. I have to write that in Swear as well? Or no, yeah, that's why that's so so sorry. So, um, if you look into OP, Open API spec or gRPC, um, 
you out of the box, you can generate your clients in Python, Java, Kotlin, C, whatever you want. So your primary application is written in the language that you want it to be. And then it's using the HTTP calls to connect to Sidecar. Okay, so I have to include the Swear client libraries in my application? No. That's, that's oh, the whole point. Okay, I'm it's still not getting it. <laughs> completely two different processes. So there's full separation of the processes. Your primary yeah. application only has to make the HTTP calls or gRPC calls. All right, so, so the... As if you could put sidecar miles away, uh, it would still work. It's just that because it's a sidecar, it's on the same system, therefore the calls are so slightly faster and you can use the local ports. But there is, they, you know, from logical perspective, they completely do different processes and primary application does not have any dependencies on the sidecar other than it knows it's a rest endpoint. So when you compile Sidecar, uh, you know, when you deploy the, the, the whole uh, solution, you create, let's say, a Docker image of your primary application with no Sidecar dependencies, dotting, and then you create your Sidecar image, and then you configure your application to hit the port of the Sidecar and use the HTTP or gRPC to execute, to, to make calls to it. Okay, so it's that's when it's like a proxy, yeah. It's yeah, the the it sort of is a proxy, and that's that's the whole distinction between proxies and platforms. Like with the proxy, um, you proxy traffic, but you don't change the content, right? So let's say you're making, a, a, you know, you want to connect to. Uh, Kafka broker, you start, your primary application would have the uh, dependency of the Kafka library. It, you know how to format your message for Kafka, and then you send it, and then the sidecar proxy intercepts it, and might do some metrics on it, and then forwards it on. With the platform, your primary application remakes, uh, doesn't have any dependencies on Kafka. All it has to do is, okay, I want to have pops up on this uh, HTTP interface, so I'm going to send message there. And then the sidecar takes that payload and creates either a Kafka message or NATS or AWS, whatever you want. So sidecar provides this abstraction uh, layer that your primary application is becoming independent of the underlying bucket. How do you configure the sidecar then? Um, so, yeah, when you deploy, we have a whole config section saying, okay, so I need this bucket, this bucket, and uh, such a different bucket. Uh, and then primary application knows, okay, so this topic, well, at least for pops of you have topics or queues, whatever you want to call them. So it says, oh, yeah, I want to send message to that topic. Let's say topic A. And then Sidecar looks at the incoming message over HTTP, says there's a header, okay, topic A. So I know that topic A is mapped to Kafka topic, something or other, whatever you want to name it, right? So you have this independence. You can write your primary application against some sort of a Adobe test driver, uh, connect your application the way you want, test them in isolation, and then you know, configure your um, environment uh, in the meantime, and you know, they, they've topics that applications though are sort of logical and then Sidecar has its own physical topics. Are you using uh, some sort of like different com configuration language other than Rust? No, uh, no actually configuration is just a flat YAML file. Um, quite sure, so, so cause, but this is kind of an example config file that uh, uh, we would use for Sphere. Uh, is it visible? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, like you, so this is the IP port of your sidecar. Oh, sorry, IP address of your sidecar ports for a different interface. So it exposes 8080, 51, 52. And, um, you know, this is where the tracing should go to uh, for sidecar logs. And then we have different buckets. So you have PopSop, uh, Kafka, NATS. And then, you know, this is where the broker for Kafka would be. 
and what sort of topics we going to deal. So um, the client topic is subscribe to application A, which is then mapped to real Kafka topic called response and same produced to app A is mapped to uh, Kafka topic request. And I'm similar for um, NAT. Uh, and then for stores, we have Redis and DynamoDB. So here you go, um, I want to uh, write to a table client or not, and then similar for DynamoDB and other. Backups. And the Kafka and the Redis are some other deployments somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Kafka is, well, that's your uh, enterprise broker, if you have one or not, or, or, you know, if you're running in AWS, it could be Kinesis, or it could be AWS Kafka. So, so, so the whole point of not, uh, of Sphere is that, well, I've written my business logic, I tested it and run it locally, now I'd like to move it to the cloud with a minimum force. But I'd like to use the cloud native tool. So let's say, you know, locally I might have my um, uh, my own Kafka or uh, whatever one that's provided by Confluent. But in uh, Azure, well, I'd like to use the Azure Kafka because, uh, or AWS Kafka because that's supported by Amazon, right? So um, uh, Shvir gives you this abstraction layer that you can switch from one environment to another environment without having to rebuild your application code, right? Because there's no dependencies in your application code in the main business logic. There's no dependencies on Kafka. There's no dependencies on NAST, Redis, Dynamo, none of those. Actually, there's no, again, as a stressing, there's no dependencies on Shvir. All you need to do is just make to HTTP call or gRPC call. Are you are you using some sort of like plugin system? Let's say no. I don't have no. I I don't want to use Kafka or the other thing. So I, well, I want to have... you. So we. I, I was messing a little bit with the conditional compilation. So in theory, NAT is an optional, um, and you don't have to compile it in. So you can enable different functionality based on that. It was more like proof of concept, uh, really just to see whether it would work, it does work. So you could reduce your, if you're deciding that you only want to use Kafka and uh, that's the, the environment that you're going to support and you want to build your own version of Sphere for it. Yeah, you could uh, uh, you, you could have the, the, the conditional compilation and then remove lots of other dependencies from your code, absolutely. But um, lots of that, would have to be implemented as such to make it more modular, the moments only for nuts. Um, but uh, so this is uh, client API proto. So this is the, the interface that uh, nuts would expose uh, as um, uh, to, to its client, right? So if you take this file and you run it through gRPC tools, that will generate you the uh, stub for your client application. So then you can make those calls very quickly and then play around. And similar for um, so open API, client API, whichever one you want. So YAML. So this is this describes your system. Uh, the, 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 this describes the um, the the APIs of. Um, so yeah, you can open in Swagger and. So this is documentation. So you basically you go post to pop sub subscribe, you provide some sort of payload and it gives you, you know, whether it was processed or not. You can up subscribe or publish, right? So, you know, you provide your topic name. So, and again, you know, you, you can take this file, uh, run it through open API tools to generate different uh, cli clients in different technologies. So Python, Java, uh, Kotlin, I don't know what else, you know, different flavors of Java, stuff like that. So the question is, how do you deal with different schemas on Kafka, et cetera? Is it all JSON? Um, well, this is the whole thing. There's no different schemas because uh, the, the sidecar controls the schema. Um, and say with that, so, you know, it's from the other, 
enterprise architecture perspective, you know, you would like that all those, uh, uh, all that logic that's to put into the sidecar is shared amongst all the applications. So, um, you know, if you need to deal with different schemas, then uh, Swara, the, the uh, Shvir would have that logic inside and your business logic as such is completely unaware of that. So that allows you then to migrate from one schema to another schema or standardize on a single schema in a sort of a controlled fashion. You know, the it uh, don't get me wrong, site three, this approach is great for um, new applications. If you start from scratch, the you know brownfield uh, applications could be migrated to it. Um, but uh, you know, if if you're doing it, then you know, Sphere gives you this abstraction layer. You can stick lots of heavy lifting, bespoke logic inside of it, keep your business process uh, sort of clean and um, and portable. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. So, but does that mean then that you I mean, you'd have to write something on top of uh, Sphere to <clears throat> actually handle your like schema and some of the business logic, right? Or rather, some of the systems parts. Of um, again, it depends, right? If you, you know, the, the you could add that logic, uh, you know, yourself. I mean. This is an open source project. You can take it and tweak it and tailor it to your needs. Um, it's uh, nothing stopping you. It, the sidecar is an approach that allows you to achieve a certain level of abstraction. You know, uh, Sphere is one example. And you know, the other way, you know, to keep uh, Sphere portable would be that okay, I just take the payload and I pass the payload to the you know to the client, and then the client has to know what to do with that. So. There are these are the like sort of practical considerations that look. There's no clients for Sphere at the moment. It's not be, it hasn't been deployed in Anger, and I have I'm pretty sure you know once you start testing it in Anger, there'll be lots of other features that I haven't thought of or thought of, but decided oh, yeah, well, I don't need it now. So so you know it's uh, that decision is sort of up to you later on. You know uh, what how how and what you want to do with that. Like there's no problem adding a different bucket, which is bespoke to your application. Okay, so for, you know if I'm going to this particular broker, that particular schema I'm getting, and stuff like that. You know, so uh, there there is tons of room for additional stuff in there. 